But I'll never forget, I had dinner with Charlie Munger, Warren Buffett's business partner, and he just over and over again just kept saying, investing is so hard now. It's so hard. You just can't make the returns that you used to be able to. And I think that's true for his style of investing. But for our style of investing, we've been able to have tremendous success at a smaller scale with a different strategy. So I just think there's, you know, there's no rules. There's always opportunity in the world. This episode is brought to you by WeWork. Being able to work remotely is a game changer. You know, you don't have to spend time and money commuting and often you can just work from anywhere in the world. But it does have its downsides too. You know, it can get pretty lonely working from home. And if you're off traveling, it can get really hard to find somewhere to sit down and work that's quiet and doesn't have sticky tables. That's where WeWork comes in. WeWork is a co-working space with offices all over the world. They have everything you need. Fast Wi-Fi, free tea and coffee, Tons of desk space and meeting rooms, so that you always have somewhere to go to get your work done, whether that's alone or with friends and coworkers. And with WeWork On Demand, you can book co-working space by the day and meeting rooms by the hour at locations wherever you need. To get a great deal from my friends at WeWork, just go to my special link, we.co forward slash Brian 50. That's we.co forward slash B-R-Y-A-N 50. Download the WeWork app and enter this code to get 50% off your next booking. Hi, I'm Andrew Wilkinson. I'm an entrepreneur and investor, and you're on Behind the Brand with Brian Elliott. Everyone, welcome to another episode of the show. Andrew, welcome. Thank you. Great to be here. I usually ask my guests, how did you get this job? Well, it was a very weird path. Um, 20 years ago, I was a barista, and I was really lost. I dropped out of college. I wasn't sure what I was going to do. Um, and these two guys kept coming into the coffee shop where I worked and they would just come in around 10 AM and they'd go on their laptops until two and they just sit there all day. And one day I asked them, you know, what do you guys do? And they said, we're web designers. We, uh, make websites for local businesses. And I started asking them questions about how that worked. And I ran the numbers in my head and I realized that these guys were making a fortune and, at that moment, I was like, oh my God, I want to be the guy drinking the espresso, not the guy making it. And so I got on the bus after work and I went to a local bookstore and I bought a business or a, a book on web design. And uh, that was it. I, I started designing websites. I walked into a pulled pork barbecue joint and I asked the guy if uh, I could design a website for him for 500 bucks. And he said, yes. Um, and then, you know, flash forward 20 years and, uh, you know, my business evolved from starting in uh, the digital agency space, working with companies like Apple, Google, Disney, Walmart. Um, I started incubating a whole bunch of software companies, started about 10 different businesses. Some of those failed, some of those worked. Um, And then about 12 years ago, um, I was sitting on a bunch of money. I'd sold a business and I was feeling a little bit lost. I wasn't quite sure what I wanted to do. I knew I couldn't just keep starting businesses over and over again. And so I picked up a book about Warren Buffett and I'd always thought that Warren Buffett was, you know, some boring stock picker guy. I had really no interest in investing, but when I read about Buffett, I realized that he had abstracted business to the most extreme degree that, you know, if you think about it, when you're, when you're a freelancer, you do the work yourself. And then the breakthrough is that you delegate some of the work that you don't enjoy to other people. Um, You know, the next level of that is you have executives who run whole parts of your business, but Buffett had actually hired CEOs that run all, ran all of his businesses. And he was doing it at a fortune 10 scale. I mean, he had one of the largest businesses in the world. And when you looked at his day to day, he just lay on a couch reading all day. And once or twice a year, he'd make a decision to buy a business and hire a CEO. And so when I read about that, I was like, oh my God, this guy's figured out the cheat codes to life and to business. And I set out to copy him. And so uh, I switched from starting to buying businesses. And today we're a publicly traded holding company. We own about 45 different businesses, ranging from everything from uh, social networks like Letterboxd and Dribbble to, uh, you know, a Yerba Mate business, uh, the AeroPress coffee maker company, all sorts of different things. Wow. (laughs) Um, Yeah. where do I start? I mean, that's incredible. Um, let's go back in the chronology. Um, put a timestamp on 
the barista years? So yeah, that was in 2006. And uh, I had, you know, gone through high school, kind of feeling a bit lost, not very engaged. I was a pretty bad student. I passed math 11 by 1% that my teacher kind of gave me a pity percent so that I would be able to graduate. And I through through high school, I was running a tech news website. I had kind of taught myself how to build basic websites. I'd met a couple other um, nerds online and we had started this tech news website. And so I thought I wanted to be a journalism, a journalist, because that's what I was doing. I was writing articles and reporting. And through that, you know, at age 17, I got to go meet Steve Jobs and interview him and, you know, travel to all the Macworld conferences. So when I graduated high school, I actually went to journalism school and I lasted about two or three months as I started realizing what it meant to be a journalist in the year 2004, 2005, I realized that was not the life for me. I didn't want to go work at a newspaper. To me, it kind of felt like um, learning how to develop photos when digital cameras have come out. Yeah, those were pretty incredible years. I mean, for those who didn't go through it, if you're, you know, you know, looking back in the time machine, 2004, you know, Facebook is just coming out of the colleges. Uh, 05, this little website called YouTube launches. Uh, In 2006, the barista years, uh, uh, YouTube sells to Google. And then the following year, 07, Steve Jobs announces the very first iPhone. So these are like, I mean, these are explosive years. And and I remember... um, I was at Universal Pictures at the time. I had a big job in brand marketing and uh, I was in home entertainment and I had a $50 million PL marketing all of Universal's biggest movies at the time. Um, and I didn't really understand what was happening, but I could feel the movement under my feet that this thing that we were calling digital marketing, it was changing and evolving. It would soon, you know, speaking of, you know, 2007, that year, I think South by Southwest Twitter launches. Uh, so there's a lot happening. And then 08, of course, you had the Great Recession, the big crash of everything. And so um, the years you're talking about, 04, I mean, we're just coming out of the dot-com bust. Like, so much is happening. It's like, I mean, it's such a moving target. It's hard to predict. I'm just, I'm just I guess, marveling at your self-awareness because it was such a volatile time. What was, um, I don't know that I had a macro picture, you know, I didn't, I, I was a kid, I barely understood what was going on. What I did know is that my journalism professors were assigning me really boring stories <laughs> and I didn't like writing hard news. Yeah. You know, I wanted to write about what I wanted to write about. And I saw blogs like Engadget and Gawker popping, popping up and I realized that I didn't need formal training. I just needed to be a good writer and that I could do it myself yeah. if I wanted to. And, you know, the interesting thing, it was a bit of a lesson because I actually felt like the the digital revolution had passed me by. Um, you know, I graduated high school in 2004. The internet bubble had already come and gone, and it seemed like I'd missed the opportunity. And then, like you said, all of a sudden, all these amazing things happened, and I was able to ride the wave with uh, the iPhone. And I think a lot of people starting out today, um, you know, they hear from entrepreneurs like me that, oh, my God, it's so much harder now than when I started But I mean, look at like Vision Pro coming out, right? There's a whole new market about to open up in VR, AR. So I think, um, you know, there's no perfect time to start a company. Every time looks flawed at the moment. Mm -hmm. But uh, in retrospect, I did get lucky in terms of the iPhone launch. Yeah. So uh, let me just dig in a little bit and ask another question, which is you've had a certain level of success. I mean, tremendous success, really, comparatively speaking to the average human. Uh, But like is now... Is it easier to start something now that you have all this experience and maybe resources, financial and otherwise, uh, or is, or was it easier back then when you had less to lose? Well, there's a great Bob Seger quote, which is, it's like a, a lyric from one of his songs where he says, I wish I didn't know now what I didn't know then. So I find that what I used to do is... For example, I started a cat furniture business because I had a cat 
And I had, uh, I was finding all this really horrifically ugly furniture. And so I just, you know, one manic night, I said, I should start a cat furniture business. And I went and I started one. And the reason I started one was because I didn't know how hard e-commerce was. I didn't know how capital intensive it would be, how miserable it would be. And so I did it. And so, you know, me and my business partner joke that we've spent the last 20 years taking forks and sticking them in electrical sockets and eventually learning not to do that. Um, and and really, so is it easier for me to start a business today? Objectively, yes, because I have capital. I can, you know, rally a bunch of interesting people together to do something. But I think it is harder than ever to, to be competitive. It's easier than ever to start a business, but to actually maintain a competitive advantage is harder than ever with AI and everything that's going on. I mean, if you think about it, two years ago, if you started a very, very boring, if you thought of a boring enough idea and it was a problem that people had, you could build custom software that would solve that and you could make a lot of money. I think with AI coming out, um, in the next five years, a lot of companies are just going to start building their software themselves because the AI can do it. So I think the ground is shifting under our feet, but with every loss comes an opportunity. Yeah, well said. And I guess that's the lesson that I was thinking about extracting from all this. It's like that term, everything and nothing has changed, right? It's, it's still the same algorithm. It's like there's some sort of disruption. Uh, the early adopters or the people that recognize uh, things that are happening sort of somewhat predictively can jump on a trend and be have like this first mover advantage. Uh, the people who come next wave, there's still some advantage and they can get ahead. But it's, it's like, you know, it's, it's the same old algorithm. It just keeps happening. And so I kind of feel like you can take comfort from that. Like if you missed the first train, another train's coming right behind it. You just got to get on. You have to, start moving your bones. You got to start doing stuff. Well, and it's part of a, I think it's a generational, it's a generational pattern as well that the older people who are more experienced, they always say things are different, things are harder, and the kids don't have what they need to, um, they don't have the capabilities to do what we did back in the day. They're not tough enough. And Robert Greene has this great book called The Laws of Human Nature. And he talks about generations and how over time as people get older, there's always this pattern. And one of the patterns is to say, this generation is the last generation. We're the last great generation. And the people coming up just don't have what it takes. So I, f it's funny, I kind of feel that way a little bit. I look back and think, man, it was so much easier when I was doing it. But I'll never forget, I had dinner with Charlie Munger, Warren Buffett's business partner. And he just over and over again, just kept saying, investing is so hard now. It's so hard. You just can't make the returns that you used to be able to. And I think that's true for his style of investing. But for our style of investing, we've been able to have tremendous success at a smaller scale with a different strategy. So I just think there's, you know, there's no rules. There's always opportunity in the world. Yeah. No, I, I mean, I share your optimistic view. I guess that's my point is, you know, for, for the new founders and entrepreneurs and, you know, people who are running businesses, I think you can take comfort in that. It's like, you know, um, now is still probably the best time ever to start something new. Of course, that old phrase about, you know, when's the best time to plant a tree? Well, it would have been 20 years ago. Sure. But okay. Maybe you weren't around. And so if you're born today, like today is the best get, day to get started. Um, there's certain economic advantages. Sure. Uh, in the past, but everything changed, variables change. And so, you know, just, I think it's all about starting and, uh, and, and, and then trying to figure it out, make your way. Um, so walk me through, I mean, you sort of blazed through that incredible path. I, I, I sort of see it in my head. I see metaphors. I see my, my brain is very visual. I see this huge hockey stick, you know, um, uh, was it truly that way? This, you know, this, meteoric rise or was it more like, you know, a slow burn? Well, I think that for the first five, five to 10 years, really, we were growing at a, you know, we we're basically doubling the company every year. If not, at least we're doing 50 to 75% annualized growth. So it was certainly a hockey stick, but it felt like a disaster. My friend Brent Bishore describes running a company as waking up to a knife fight 
and eating glass, right? Like, I, and I really yeah. feel that I would wake up every day in a panic and all of my problems had to be resolved within four to eight hours. Um, you know, it was this critical person is about to leave. We're about to lose this client. This person isn't paying us. And then times that by five, because pretty soon I was running five or six businesses. And because I didn't think like Warren Buffett, I was running them all. I, me and my business partner were the CEO and CFO of all these companies. And so the first couple of years were just disastrous chaos. We didn't know what we were doing. And we actually yeah. didn't know how good our business was. We thought it was normal to have 50 or 60% profit margins and to double every year. We had never looked at a conventional business. And so it probably took us 10 years to realize how good of a business we had and that what we were doing was working. But we really didn't know what we were doing. We just had a few things that we were really good at. Uh, one was running profitably. Two was selecting really great people. Um, and and three was, you know, honestly, it was like I got lucky with my personality that I can talk and sell. And so that was what enabled us to get all these big clients. But if it wasn't for those couple things, I, you know, we wouldn't be where we're at today. I don't want to glaze over kind of a few of the things that you've said that stand out to me. It's like, Oh, you know what? I was talking to Charlie Munger, uh, you know, who just recently passed, or I was talking to Warren, you know, like <laughs> that's pretty cool. Um, talk about, um, first, before you tell me the story of how you met, uh, Charlie, tell me how you go about selecting good people, finding good people, because that's something I hear all the time. I've done 500 plus of these interviews with some of the smartest most successful people on the planet. And, and that's definitely a thread that runs through a lot of these conversations is it's hard to find good people. It's hard to find good people. I mean, there's good people out there everywhere. Uh, but what's your selection process look like? What's the criteria? So my business partner, Chris says, there's no such thing as problems. There's only people problems. And that is far and away, like if we have, you could tell me my company is going bankrupt tomorrow, but if I look around and I've got the right team of executives or CEOs, I'll be okay. I know everything will work out. Um, it's when you have the wrong people in the wrong seats that everything is chaos. And to be honest, it's kind of a mix of um, two things. One, when we're hiring a CEO, which is most of the hiring that we do now, we generally look for somebody that first and foremost is high trust. So the question I ask is, would I let this person babysit my kids and feel comfortable doing so? Um, they are a DNA fit. They fit into the company because when you hire a CEO externally to have them come into a company, um, it's a little bit like brain surgery. If you don't do it properly, the body is going to reject the new organ. And when it's the brain, that's really, really bad. Um, and three, I'm looking for someone who has the right skills and typically what we look for is somebody who's run a same or similar business with a similar business model or in the same kind of area and where they're, they've run at kind of double the scale. Because I know that pretty it'll be quite obvious to them when they get into the, call it the $5 million business, they know how to take it to the $10 million level because that's where they were at before. Um, and then finally, I just look for someone who I nod along with. So A, I wanna, when I'm sitting with them, the trust factor is huge. I want to know that they're a human. I want to connect with them. I want to feel um, energized when I leave my conversation. And I also want to be nodding along. When I ask them, what's your vision for this business? I want to go, oh my God, I, you know, I'd thought that same thing, or I hadn't even thought of that. That's brilliant. I don't want to be going, oh God, I don't know that if that's the right solution. Because what I've realized is that people will do what they want to do. If you bring in Let's just use marketing as an example. If you bring in a marketer and on day one, they say, I really think the right solution is to spend a bunch of money on Google ads. And you say, well, X, Y, Z, I think we should do brand advertising on podcasts. I've just realized that no matter what, they will always default to the thing they know and that they want to do, even if you debate them or explain it to them. Um, and so, yeah, you're kind of the rider on the elephant with people and you just have to hope the elephant's going where, uh, where you want to go. So tell me that story about meeting Charlie Munger. Yeah. So, um, 
I got really lucky. Um, one of our investors, Andrew Marks, um, called me up one day and he said, hey, do you want to go for dinner with Charlie Munger? And I said, when and where? I'll, you know, I'll, I'll get on a plane right now. Where do I need to be? And we got really lucky. We got to um, go for dinner with Charlie. And I've met a lot of heroes. And he's one of those rare cases where you want to meet your heroes and they are who they appear to be. Um, he's exactly the way he is at the Berkshire meeting. You know, he he was like the old man on the mount. And a bunch of us would just sit there at his dinner table in his house. And we just pepper him with questions all night. And uh, we he it was awesome. We had a really great time meeting him. And uh, we ended up getting to know him and helping him with some business problems. So it was really cool. I mean, you're this wonderkins. Like, you know, you're... Not even forty yet, I'm guessing. Uh, and have you ever had this experience of being underestimated? And like, how do you feel about that? Yeah, I am um, always have been. I would say the challenge that Chris and I would have is we'd hire an executive who, say, was like twenty years our senior, just even ten years our senior. And we looked like kids, you know, we were like, when we we're like 30 or something, we, you know, at that point we had 12 years plus of business experience, but we looked like kids, you know, we barely needed to shave. Chris can't even grow chest hair. Like we're, we're just like, we look really young and we would often find that people would kind of look down or it would create a weird dynamic. So we've definitely been underestimated and I'll never forget, I was at a conference it was like a, a tech conference and there's this famous venture capitalist, I won't say who, but I sat down next to him at the table and he goes, oh, tell me about your business. And I say, well, I run all these businesses, but they're all profitable. I didn't raise any money. They're all bootstrapped. And he just kind of goes, oh, a lifestyle business. Cool. And then he just turns his back on me and starts talking to the other guy. And I felt in that moment. That's what I meant. <laughs> no, 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 it wasn't Chris Saka. Uh, I have met Chris Saka though. He was, he was actually pretty nice to me when I met him. Uh, but, but, uh, yeah, so, so this guy turns his back on me and I just, you know, it's like that feeling of like, oh, I see, like, I'm not, I'm less than because I look young. And I said that, you know, in your brain, you think of bootstrap companies as these little things. And I, I've always had a chip on my shoulder about that because I think in tech, Everybody is valuing your business based on these silly, um, you know, venture valuations. How much money have you raised? Who have you raised it from? And so really until about five years ago, we flew totally under the radar. No one knew who we were really. They would hear that we had like a, you know, we had a digital agency and they'd kind of dismiss us or something. Um, and then we started talking about what we do and we went public and stuff. And now I'd say that we, you know, people, people will listen when we talk. But I very much felt the chip on the shoulder and the dismissal from lots of people. Yeah. So what's your what's your advice to people who look and feel like that? I mean, I felt that way for a long time uh, when I was in, you know, my 20s and 30s. I mean, I'm I'm at the, you know, about halfway point now, so I don't have that problem as much. Like at, there was a time where I was like, I wanted to purposely grow more facial hair. Uh, but, you know, I, I couldn't. I wanted to. But uh well, what I ended up doing is finding people who are excited about up and coming entrepreneurs, right? So there was a lot of people who would give me the cold shoulder, but there are other people like Jason Fried, who runs 37 Signals, now Basecamp and Hey. Um, I just cold emailed Jason one day and I said, Jason, I'm a big fan. I know we're going to be at the same conference. Can we have lunch? And he said, yes. And at the time, my business was doing like, 50k a month or something and Jason just went I remember him looking at me and saying you should be so proud your parents must be so excited and that felt really good and so not only was Jason somebody who you know actually just would validate like you know even just basic success and be excited for somebody but also someone who's excited to talk to a young person and I realized that you know if you if you're the plucky boy wonder people do actually generally want to root for you. You know, forget the jerks who are going to turn their back on you, but generally people want to talk to you. And I find that um, what I would do is I would research the person I want to meet or I know I'm going to meet and I'd look through their history and I'd go, what are the similarities in our backgrounds? So maybe it would be that we dropped out of school. Maybe it's we bootstrapped our company. Um, maybe we, you know, have a troubled relationship with our dads, you know, whatever it is. 
And I would just try and mention that when I talked to them and it would often create a connection. Um, so I don't, I, I think there's a real advantage to being different and less than, and the more insecure you are about it, the more of a disservice that is. I think you have to embrace that people are going to want to ruffle your hair and say, I like your moxie kid. <laughs> I love that advice because, um, the biggest, one of the biggest mistakes I made early on was fronting. I, you know, I just pretended like I was bigger, better, you know, older, you know, whether it's like me trying to grow more facial hair or whatever, like aesthetically, you know, dressing up. Uh, I mean, there's certain advantages. Um, people do judge a book by its cover, but at the same time, I, early on I was fronting, I was pretending. And I think that's super advice. It's just like, I think you have to lean into the strength you have at the moment. And sometimes like youth, you know, not knowing what you don't know is like, can be an incredible strength. Like you said before, like you didn't know how insurmountable or like you were about to enter into this business that was kind of like trying to scale Mount Everest, but you didn't know any better. So you just went for it. And then because you were tenacious enough or had the skill, you're able to do it. So I think, um, just being self-deprecating too. Just saying, I don't know what the hell I'm doing. I'm the patsy at the poker table. I still say that to people. I mean, I'm, I'm learning philanthropy right now and I'm meeting all these amazing philanthropists and I'm just saying, I'm an idiot. I don't know anything. Teach me what, you know, where were you at 10 years ago? And I find people actually really resonate with that. They want to teach you. They want to help you. But if you show up and you're too cool for school, they're like, screw this guy. Right. Right. Well, and, and I think that's human nature, right? Like that humility factor uh, it lets other people feel like they can also be vulnerable. They could be themselves. Otherwise everyone's protecting their own little Island. Um, I've, I've had bosses like that where it's like, you know, I, I was more talented than my boss. Uh, and, and I was trying to be humble about it, but my boss was fronting mainly because he didn't want to be exposed as a fraud. Like, you know, like he didn't want to disclose too much. And so, uh, yeah, I, th I love that advice where you're just going in with vulnerability, with humility, with, you know, open eyes and ears, open heart. I love that. What is, um, what is one of the, like these deeply held beliefs that you've had maybe about business or about human nature, maybe just three to five years ago that you no longer have today? Well, I think the biggest belief was that I could change people. Um, you know, if I just explain something clearly, so let's say that, you know, one of our leaders, one of our CEOs was doing something that I didn't think made sense strategically. If I just sit down and I talk with her and, you know, explain everything really clearly and walk her through the logic, surely she would, you know, change. And, um, you know, again, I was on a call with Charlie Munger and I asked him this question, have you ever been able to change people's mind because we're really struggling with this? And he said, you know, I'm 99 and I've never changed anyone's mind. I don't think what we find is that as we debate with somebody, they actually pound in their beliefs. And so that's been a big relief for me because I, I view people, you know, people are not changeable other than if somebody changes themselves and in order to change themselves, they have to hit like rock bottom. And I don't mean alcohol and drugs necessarily. Like, let's say that you're, you have narcissistic qualities and one day you wake up and no one wants to be your friend. Well, maybe you'll have a breakthrough and change. Maybe that's your rock bottom. And so, or maybe with one of our leaders, they try the strategy and it just fails. And in doing so they change. And what we've realized is that we need to allow people to have their own failures and not try and change them. And so it's been a bit of a sad realization for me because I like to impact our businesses. You know, if I see a great opportunity in one of our companies, I love to be able to call the CEO up excitedly and say, oh my God, I just talked to this person and we should partner with this company and do this. But I've actually noticed it's a huge disservice to the CEOs and they get very annoyed. So I've actually had to really remove my hands. Yeah, and I'll bet, tell me how difficult that's been. To, you know, I think the inclination of most people is to micromanage. I mean, and why wouldn't you? I mean, if it's your baby and you've you've nurtured this business and then you've hired a CEO to take over and, and she maybe is not running it the way you would have run it, um, that's got to be incredibly difficult, especially if you're now running. I think it's like um, the way I put it, is 
There's a big difference between chopping wood with your buddies and feeling the calluses on your hands at the end of the day. Let's say that you chop wood and you sell cords of wood door to door with your friends. That's a very different experience than being the factory owner in a pulp mill and watching all the, you know, everything get chopped by a thousand workers and machines and stuff. You know, you're sitting in this little cold office above them. And I think it can feel a little bit like that. It's like, if you don't have the calluses on your hands and you weren't involved in the process of creating whatever it is, you don't feel the satisfaction of it. So for example, you know, AeroPress can release a new product and I'll be very excited that they've released the new AeroPress Clear or something like that, but I don't feel it. You know, I didn't work on it. I didn't do the design. I didn't, you know, make any decisions on it. And so it's kind of like, you know, like I said, business abstracted to the ultimate degree, but I find that I need to find other outlets for my creative impulses. Otherwise, I will kind of feel depressed. If I don't have an outlet and a thing that at the end of the day, I can look at and go, I manifested this and I created this. This is my work output. It isn't just emails and Zooms and phone calls. Um, you know, I really need that. That's very important. Yeah. So let's stay on that thread for a second. So what have you learned about yourself from building these businesses? What are you good at? What are you bad at? So I'm like a, I'm like a laser. I get very focused on an idea and I'm very, very good at starting it. Like, um, the way I'd put it is I love, um, I love lighting little fires everywhere. Right. But then I get distracted and walk off and I light another one. And so in the early days that would manifest as, you know, we had the original agency and then I would come up with an idea for a software company. And then as soon as we got into the hard part, you know, once we designed the website and we come up with the whole idea and we started to have to make really boring decisions, like how does customer support work? Um, you know, when someone clicks into this screen and then this happens, you know, do we show an error message and how does that look? I'm just like, I'm checked out. I don't want to think about that. And so I would usually get bored and move on to another one. And I'd start another company and another company and another company. And what I would not do, which I needed to, was actually hire somebody to replace me as I left. And so I'm very good at zero to one. And then the other thing I'm good at is um, call it 10 to a thousand. Like I can come up with a strategy to grow a business massively, but I'm not the one to implement it. And so, um, you know, what I used to do is I would read these biographies of Steve Jobs and Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos and Zuckerberg and Gates. And I'd go, oh my God, like I just need to learn more. I just need to read more management books. I just need to whip myself harder. And ultimately I realized I'm not that. I am not that at all. I am, um, I'm good at the beginning of things and then I'm not good at, at scale. I don't like operating businesses. I like five, 10 person companies, um, or I like interacting with CEOs directly. And that was a really, to be honest, that was a very sad realization because in my mind, I was, I wanted to be a great CEO, but I just realized I'm not a good manager of people. You know, I'm really not, I'm good one-on-one, -on -one, but I'm not a good manager of groups. Yeah. I mean, back to your key learning, you know, from Charlie, like people don't change. Uh, and, you know, we can work on skills. You know, uh, if I want to have a, a great jump shot uh, or even try to slam dunk, I mean, I could work out my calves and I could work really hard and maybe I'll get close to that. But it's like someone who's already six, eight and can just dip the ball. in. it's like they've already got the skills. So why not just focus on what I'm good at? Well, there's people who love that. You know, I've got friends who run businesses where they love coming up with a new hiring policy or a 360 review process, or, you know, they love hosting team events and being the boss and speaking in front of all of them. And over and over again, I do those things. I know all the dance moves, but it just didn't feel natural for me. Yeah. Well, I think it's smart because what I'm hearing you saying is like really lean into your strengths. Know thyself, right? That's the it's the old adage. And I mean, obviously that's worked really well for you. This series is called Behind the Brand. We talk a lot about brands, branding, building your brand. I mean, I started this whole series um, off the heels of quitting my job at Universal, starting a production company, and then realizing I may or may have not started at the worst time in history, basically January 2008. And by 2000, well, 
by September of that year, sort of all hell started breaking loose for me when all the clients went away and the budgets dried up and I needed to figure out how to save my own business. So I started reaching out to people who I thought had built brands and weathered storms and, and started asking them how they did it. And um, I want to know, uh, how do you think about brand building? You've built several companies. First of all, how do you define what a brand is? Hmm. You know, I don't really think about it that way, but I know that it's so organic for me. Like I will, I will think about, so right now, for example, there's a local independent theater and I'm looking at um, giving them some money through my foundation just as a fun side project. And I started thinking, okay, right now it's not well known. There's not a great brand. What would that look like? So in my mind's eye, I start going, okay, what are the colors? What's the, what, what's the aesthetic style? And I just, I kind of go from there. Um, and interestingly, I mean, Tiny is a very unconventional brand. When you think about it, we are, we're not a private equity firm because we were doing it all with our own money originally. And um, really, like, if you look at all these private equity firms or holding companies or whatever, they have these weird names like Cerberus Asset Management or Blackstone or Blackrock. They sound like hulking. And you look at their websites and it's like, you know, a photo of like a huge skyscraper. And then it's like a guy in a suit with his arms crossed. And I was like, man, fuck that. <laughs> like, I want to be the anti. I want to be the the pirate version of that. And so we said, well, what's the most humble, smallest name we could come up with? And we, you know, we mirrored them. Uh, we, uh, we did the opposite. And so we just came up with the name Tiny, which, you know, even at the time, we weren't that small. We were, you know, we had a pretty sizable business, but we wanted to be humble. And we wanted it to be friendly and goofy and cartoony. And so if you go to our website, it's like all bright colors and cool cartoons. Our language is very, um, very mellow. And one of the things I realized is that private equity firms, they sell to the wrong customer. So private equity firms, the way that they make the most of their money is via fees. So they go out and they go to all these pension funds and they raise billions of dollars and then they get 2% of all the money that they manage. And it's just guaranteed money. And so it's very um, attractive for them to become asset gatherers, just keep raising more and more money and get larger and larger fee structures and stuff. And so what I realized is that creates this perverse incentive where the way that they position themselves and talk about themselves is selling to investors, selling to pension funds, where they want to hear these terms like compound annual growth rate and earnings before interest and depreciation and all this stuff. But their customer, when you think about it, who is the private equity customer? It's founders of companies that are selling to them. And so what I think we did differently is we said, well, who's our customer? Let's appeal to our customer. And the way we're doing that is by being friendly and humble, having a great reputation and just speaking like normal people and getting deals done very, very quickly. And so I think that's basically what we've done. We've, we've kind of done it very differently by just trying to be very straightforward. And like I said before, we are effectively just doing what Berkshire Hathaway does. I mean, Warren Buffett speaks very humbly. He does very large deals in a very short period of time. And people want to sell to him because he's just a nice, normal guy. And so we're just doing that for the 21st century. I, I love that. Uh, so let me just sort of recap, restate what I heard you say. Um, a brand kind of begins with your values, your vision, but a brand is a shorthand for who you are and what you stand for. And, you know, I was talking to uh, my mentor, Seth Godin, about this. The way he framed it for me is he said, Brian, you know, a brand is not your logo and it's, you know, it's not the copywriting. He said, but, you know, if you close your eyes and even, you know, use all five of your senses, um, imagine if Nike built a hotel. And you could sort of imagine what that would look like and even smell like, feel like, you know, inside. Uh, and if you can kind of do that with your brand, and it sounds like what, like what you guys have done and repeated several times, you know, Tiny included, like you set out to differentiate yourself from 
the others. You, you know, you didn't want to march with the herd. You purposely became the anti, you, you know, used the word, the pirate version of, I love that. Um, it kind of reminds me of a super disruptive ad in the sixties. I think it was, did you ever watch that show Mad Men? So in one of the campaigns that they highlight in that show is when they launched uh, uh, Volkswagen. And I think the campaign headline was um, think small. So like what everyone, you know, Cadillac was going. Is the, was that the lemon? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. It's like one of my favorite ad campaigns, but it's like, you know, Cadillac's going big and, and everyone was just going big because that's what luxury was supposed to look like and what everyone was supposed to want. And, you know, then they had the challenge of selling this tiny little German car called the Volkswagen Beetle. Uh, and they went complete 360 or 180 rather. And uh, so I love the shorthand that you've created. Um, you've also done things that are familiar, uh, which is be approachable, uh, act quickly, be decisive, uh, taking a page from another brand's playbook. I mean, that's, if it's already working and you can sort of replicate that, but also make it your own, there's a pretty good chance that it's going to work out, right? So, you know, inadvertently, you've created this incredible brand that stands for something. And then ultimately, once you create it, then it's sort of in the hands of the people that have the experience, right? Like, so whoever's interacting with you, doing business with you, then they get to decide uh, what your brand looks like and feels like and and all that based on their experience. So if you have 100 customers, you might have 100 different impressions or definitions of what your brand is. But hopefully it's aligned with your original vision and your value. And then sometimes even the customer will take it to new heights, use it in ways that you didn't expect. And then that's a really cool evolution takes place. And some of the great brands that exist today, that's they don't have to go into great detail to talk about it. They sort of put it out there in the world and then let people um, reimagine it or use it in a way that they would have never. So I love that. One of the brands uh, that you are part of now is this Yerba Mate brand. Let's talk a little bit about that venture. How, tell me that story. How'd that come about? So um, I'm a big health nerd. I kind of listen to all the podcasts and I had some medical issues about 10 years ago and I had to kind of become my own doctor, learn how to read medical journals and all that kind of stuff. And um, I ended up solving, solve my medical problems, but I ended up just getting really, really into that world. Um, and I got into the Huberman Lab podcast when he first started. Um, within a few episodes, I messaged him and I just said, hey, I'd love to have you up to Victoria to give a talk, which is something I do uh, a lot. It's actually a really interesting way that I've used money because, you know, money, um, you know, I you buy a nice house, you, uh, you know, buy a nice car. There's not that much else you can do with it. At least that's what I've found. But one way that I love to spend money is meeting interesting people. And so I went to Huberman and I said, hey, I'd love to uh, fly you up here and have you talk at the university. Either we can donate to your lab or we can pay you a fee or whatever. And so we donated to his lab. He came up and we got coffee and we just hit it off. I really liked him and we kept in touch. And uh, we ended up doing a partnership where we, my foundation funded a bunch of science that he chose and we kind of did donor matching and stuff. And I was talking to him and Rob, his business partner. And, you know, we said, look, are there any categories that you're interested in that you don't think are being served very well. And they said, well, all the yerba mate out there, um, it's bitter, it's smoked, it's got way too much sugar. You know, some of the other brands have like 30 grams of sugar in it, which is just crazy. It's like more than a can of Coke. And so we went out and we said, well, what if we found a brand to buy and we worked together to, you know, make the ultimate yerba mate that you want? And so uh, we found this wonderful business called Matina based out in Montreal. Um, and we ended up uh, partnering with Huberman and we bought uh, we bought 51%. The founder kept uh, 24%. Huberman bought 25%. And uh, he basically worked with us to formulate uh, a sugar-free version. And we're about to release that, which I'm super excited about. I'm actually drinking it right now. Um, so yeah, it's been, yeah, you really sent me cool. some, it's, 
is delicious. Um, can you go into your health journey a little bit? Because, uh, you know, it's almost like I'm looking in the mirror, like we're telling the same story. About 10 years ago, wheels kind of came off the bus for me. And so I, I had this very ex- almost exact same story experience. And I also stumbled on, well, I found Huberman through Joe Rogan. Um, and I was instantly hooked. But so how did you hack your way back or find, you know, find your way back to health through your own own means? So it was really frustrating. Um, when I was 20, I was 26, I think, I started having like crippling acid reflux, which is very uncommon for someone who's 26 in good health. I had a low body weight, like there was none of the usual flags uh, or obvious triggers. And I tried every restrictive diet. I tried proton pump inhibitors. I was getting to the point where seven or eight years in, I'd gone to six or seven different doctors Um, And I was seriously exploring having permanent surgery done on my throat, our esophagus, to try and solve this reflux issue. And I built this mind map and I had all the, you know, all the scholarly, you know, journals and articles and all my ideas for what it could be. And one weird phenomenon I had was that I couldn't burp all my life. I'd never been able to burp. And, uh, you know, my brothers would be burping the ABCs and I just couldn't, it, I just, nothing would come out. And so I Googled that and I found this Reddit community called no burp. And I went, okay, this is crazy. Like, but, but all the symptoms lined up. So all these people reported they would eat food or they'd drink a sparkling, you know, beverage and they'd feel this pressure and then they'd get this tightness in their throat and they'd kind of get these weird noises and gurgles, but nothing would come out. And many of them suffered from severe acid reflux. And I was like, oh my God. And, and so it turned out that there is this doctor, Dr. Robert Bastian in Chicago who one of his patients was someone from this Reddit community and had gone to him and convinced him to inject Botox endoscopically into their throat because they, their theory was that it's the cricopharyngeal muscle in the throat. And so I went to Chicago and I had the same procedure done. And for the first time in my life at age, what was it, 35, I could burp. And it was like a, a miracle. I mean, imagine not being able to fart your entire life, right? You just have this horrible pressure. So... It was amazing. And then I stopped getting acid reflux after that. I mean, it's just incredible, but also so relatable. I mean, I love doctors and nurses. My sister is a nurse at Stanford Hospital. Uh, she's, you know, she's the nurse in charge. She's incredible. I know she sell, saves lives. Um, but I had the worst luck with doctors who just couldn't figure out what's happening to me. I, I was having severe headaches. Um, at I, And I was about 35. And this was 10 years ago. I was like, I don't know why I'm suddenly getting these onset like migraines, debilitating migraines. And I couldn't work. I couldn't function. I couldn't sleep. I mean, I don't know if you've ever had a migraine headache, but you get dizzy, sometimes nauseous. You're sensitive to bright lights. It was just debilitating. And I thought, oh, maybe I'm dying. (laughs) And so like I started checking off the big ticket items first. I went to the neurologist, get an MRI scan. Then I went heart, got the carotid artery scan, heart scan, uh, all the I mean, literally everything, pulmonary expert, check my teeth, my eyes, my ears, uh, gut. And at the end of it, after thousands of dollars uh, spent, I had nothing. You know, the doctors were very myopic in their view. Of course, the hearts, you know, the heart specialist uh, wanted to put me on statins right away because that's just what you do. The neurologist threw pills at me and said, oh, just take these. You just have uh, migraines. It's just what you have. The pulmonary guy sent me a CPAP machine. I mean, just on and on and on. And it was just kind of like this comedy of errors, I thought. And so I started digging into medical journals too. And that's when I stumbled on to Huberman. And I was just like, this guy tells the truth. Like, you know, we all have some biases, but like he's really trying to do, uh, you know, the pirate version, <laughs> legitimate pirate version of alternative uh, healthcare. And the light bulb went on for me that I really need to take personal responsibility for my own health, that no one is going to come save me. Uh, as great as the doctors are individually, you know, they have all this talent. And of course, if I'm, 
you know, in a car crash and I have trauma, I mean, heart attack, stroke, I mean, doctors can save my life, but like these headaches that were killing me literally, uh, couldn't get solved. And so, uh, my res resolve was I talked to, uh, at the time I just interviewed the Seattle Seahawks quarterback, Russell Wilson, when Russell was playing for Seattle. And he remarked after I told him kind of my symptoms, he said, Brian, I think you're dehydrated. And I was like, no, 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 Russ, I drink plenty of water. He's like, no, electrolytes. And I was like, what are you talking about? Electrolytes. And I've been an athlete all my life, but, um, I was like, well, you talk about Gatorade. He goes, no, nah, way too much sugar. It's not great for you. You know, I check out this company called Element. Um, and I did some more research, found out, you know, it was Rob Wolf was behind it. The guy who wrote this book called Wired to Eat. And Rob had all these autoimmune issues. And basically he'd been on the same journey that I was on only much more scientifically and, you know, with much more expertise and sort of figured stuff out for himself and then launched this new brand of electrolytes. Anyway, so long story short, uh, I started drinking more electrolytes, started taking better care of myself, eliminated sugar, um, did more elimination kind of diet stuff and figured out what worked for me, what didn't. Got serious about getting back in the gym, focused on my sleep. And so with a combination of better sleep, slightly better nutrition, I mean, it wasn't, I didn't like completely change my diet, but it was like slight little adjustments. Uh, and then the electrolytes, like it all started coming together. And, and it was like a light switch on and off, you know, suddenly I didn't have headaches anymore and I was thriving. Uh, and so ever since I've been really focused on, you know, like optimizing my health. The one thing uh, that really caught my attention was the last World Cup that Argentina won, right? When Lionel Messi came and I heard that they brought like a thousand pounds of yerba mate. And I was like, what? What is this? <laughs> you know, and, and I started investigating what yerba mate was. And I'm not a huge coffee drinker. I mean, I drink coffee. I like the taste. It just makes me poop right away. So it's not, uh, it's not ideal. <laughs> like, you know, if I'm, if I'm running around, I just can't have it. Otherwise uh, I need a bathroom close by. But so I was, I was looking for an alternative, I, you know, uh, late night, if I'm out, you know, uh, once in a while, if I'm editing late, uh, I'll put down a Red Bull or whatever, but I know that's completely unhealthy. And uh, I don't drink soda because it's got way too much sugar. So I was really looking for something alternative. And again, when I heard about the Argentina football club, drinking all this yerba mate, I was intrigued and I did more research and I, I found some powder version of it. But, um, I mean, your story tracks, um, with mine, I'm sure so many others who have felt frustrated with their health. Um, talk to me about, uh, so how are you pronouncing it? Is it Matina? You're pronouncing it like that? Yeah. So what are you doing differently with basically taking the reins. I mean, you're, you're coming into a company that's established that already has a great product. You're trying to, I was assume, take it from good to great. Like what are you changing and, and how is it evolving? So we talk a lot about this strategy um, called one plus one equals a hundred. So the idea there is that you have, let's, let's say, um, let's give an example. So um, let's say that you have a diaper brand, right? You sell diapers. Now that's a commodity product, hard to differentiate. Maybe you can be organic or made of bamboo or something like that. But at the end of the day, it's a challenge. You have to educate the consumer for why they want that. And to do so, you need to spend hundreds of millions of dollars on marketing. So that's a hard business. I look at that business and I go, man, I don't want to get into that business. Uh, it's going to be hard to get on shelves, hard to sell D2C. Now, if Jessica Alba, who is beloved by a bunch of moms and has a huge audience, is interested in becoming a co-founder of that business, put those two things together and you have a very, very successful potentially brand. As long as the product is exceptional and she promotes it, you basically have on your P&L, instead of spending $50 million a year in marketing, you have Jessica Alba talking about it publicly for free. And so when you combine those two things, one plus one equals 100. And so for us, I mean, we looked at this business, and we went, this is already an exceptional business. It's very well run. The challenge that they had is that they were kind of capital constrained 
And frankly, it's really expensive to build a consumer packaged goods business because not only are you having to spend on the inventory as you grow, but mostly it's just a marketing problem. And so with Andrew being able to talk about it publicly and people just, you know, they trust him. And when he says something is a great product and he formulated it, formulated it, I think that's a massive halo effect. We look at it as, well, this is just a no brainer. This is one plus one equals a hundred. Um, and we're just so excited about it. I mean, like I, I didn't think I would get into it. Uh, you know, I figured I'd drink it once and it's got 130 milligrams of caffeine. So I was like vaguely terrified of it. Uh, I'm very (laughs) sensitive to caffeine, but I started drinking it every day. And I find that the caffeine high that I get is just so much more level than coffee or anything else. And so I'm, I love it. It's awesome. And it's my favorite businesses are businesses that I, um, that businesses that sell products that I use every day or that solve problems for me. Uh, that's how we got into the AeroPress coffee maker business. Um, so yeah, I am really excited about it. I mean, we were just sitting back, you know, <laughs> chopping it up, reminiscing about the good old days and all that, <laughs> you know, tracking my roots, where I came from and where I'm going. But like I say, man, it's not about the destination it's all about the journey ain't nothing changed but the weather the dangling carrot that hang from the rear view uh-huh. Your dreams in the past ain't nowhere near you uh-huh. Backseat drivers got nothing but two cents Shotgun riders too biased, they all liars I should get an A for effort, I'm too tired But I'm never giving up, that's why I'm kinda admired Role model, like it or not, I gotta play it Sugarcoat the rhyme sometimes, but still say it Said I was quitting at 40, is just a fib I'm still a kid that's wiping the food off of my bib You ever wanted something so bad that you could taste it? Cried over everything Every opportunity wasted.